Good morning. We're glad you've joined us for the Sunday morning service of Tusculum Hills Baptist Church, a caring and vibrant church that offers God's help to all people. We invite you to join us now for a special message from God's Word from Pastor Paul Gunn. The title of the message today is The Parable of the Two Sons, and I'll be preaching from Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 through 32. The three points of my message this morning are as follows. Jesus made it clear that repentance is the key. And second, Jesus made it clear that it's never too late. And third, Jesus made it clear that talk is cheap. As we know from studying the parables, Jesus often responded to questions <clears throat> with a parable. When he was asked by his disciples about forgiveness, he responded with the parable of the unmerciful servant. And in that parable, a servant was forgiven by his master who in turn was harsh to someone who owed him money. And when he was asked about what rewards the disciples would receive for giving up everything to follow him, Jesus responded with the parable of the workers in the vineyard, which I preached about a few weeks ago. And that parable was about uh, people who were paid the same wage, even though they worked for different amounts of time. Some worked longer hours than others. It's a great illustration of, of God loving all of his children, regardless of their spiritual birth order. And not only did Jesus use parables to reply to questions from his own disciples and his followers, but he used parables to reply to the opposition. In Matthew chapter 21, Jesus was coming to the end of his earthly ministry. And he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. And when he did that, people laid down their cloaks and palm branches on the street and the crowd was loud, and they cheered, Hosanna. And when Jesus went into the temple, he threw out the money changers. He healed people. Children began calling out, Hosanna. And some people got upset. The chief priests and the teachers of the law did not like what they saw. They did not like what they heard. Jesus was clearly a threat to them. Because if people started following Jesus and they started believing what Jesus was teaching, which was a fulfillment of the Old Testament, they would have found themselves in the unemployment line. And people have a way of protecting their jobs and guarding their assets, don't they? They didn't have faith that Jesus would take care of them if they became believers and followers of him. And that night, Jesus went to a nearby town called Bethany, and he spent the night there. And the next day, he cursed a fig tree for bearing no fruit, and he taught about that to his disciples. And he returned to the temple, and he began teaching. <clears throat> and by now, the religious leaders were furious. And they asked him, who gave him the authority to be teaching like this and to be teaching in the temple? And Jesus threw a question at them that they could not answer. And so he said that he would not answer their question either. And then Jesus told three parables. He told the parable of the two sons, the parable of the two tenants, and the parable of the wedding banquet. And just a moment ago, I said that Jesus taught his followers in parables. And here we have record of Jesus confronting the opposition with parables. Read with me, Matthew chapter 21, beginning with verse 28. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered, but later changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. 
For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. This parable is very simple. A man tells his two sons to go to work. One says no, later regrets it and goes and works. The other says yes, but never does anything. You know, Jesus was quite a storyteller and, and very, of course, he was God, so he could tell the story that would pull the people in. And the religious leaders fell right into this story trap. He asked who did the right thing, and they said the first son who felt bad and later went, who said no, and then later felt bad and went back to work for his father. And then Jesus explained the parable. Those who said no, but later went and worked, were considered awful by the religious leaders because Jesus explained the parable as the, the first son really were the and he gave some examples, the tax collectors, the prostitutes. The tax collectors worked for the Roman government. And they earned a living by collecting taxes from the Jewish people who were oppressed. And they were, they were in areas occupied by the Roman government. And the Jews despised living under the Romans. And so they hated the tax collectors. And the way the tax collector made his money was by charging more than what the taxes were. And so people just despise the tax collectors. And then there's the prostitute, the one who had abandoned all morals just to make money, the one who worked the world's oldest profession and was about as far away from holy as one could get, at least in their eyes. The, ones who, the one who in no way would be considered clean enough to even enter the temple much less become a follower of a religious leader. And the tax collector and the prostitute, they were, they were both people who took money but in different ways. You know, Jesus, boy, he says a whole lot about money, doesn't he? And overall, the Bible says a whole lot about it. Why? Because money gets to the core of a person. It really does. The religious leaders listening to Jesus' teaching were no doubt furious when he said the tax collector and the prostitute would enter heaven before they would. They must have been absolutely, completely shocked. The nerve of Jesus to say such a thing. Jesus was not winning new friendships that day. Let's look back at what the religious leaders had witnessed Jesus do. They saw him run money changers out of the temple. The temple had basically become a yard sale of lame animals sold for sacrifices. And the religious leaders would have known that Jesus did the right thing. But somewhere or other, these religious leaders were caught up in that economy of, of the yard sale of the lame animals. They knew Jesus was doing the right thing. They saw Jesus heal people. They saw Jesus work miracles and they heard the testimonies of others who had been healed and who saw miracles. And what, who did they think was the source of his power? Or what did they think was the source of Jesus' power? Jesus was not doing anything evil. So the source of his power could not have been Satan. The truth is that they refused to believe Jesus' power and authority were from God even though they saw healings and miracles right before their very eyes. So first this morning, I want you to note this, that Jesus made it clear repentance is the key. The key to what? Repentance is just the key to everything. The son said no to his father. He would not go work in the vineyard. He reminds me of the rebellious child that refuses to do what's right. He reminds me of the, the prodigal and the story of the prodigal son that Bill preached about a few weeks ago. Eventually the prodigal ran out of money and he returned home. He came to his senses, the Bible says. 
A long time ago when I was doing youth ministry, I remember a teenage girl who got in an argument with her mother on the church property. And she told her mom to shut up and give her the car keys. And she absolutely refused to do the right thing over and over. Now, whatever happened to her, I don't know. Rebellion. The root problem with the son who said no was rebellion. The religious elite would have thought it impossible for a tax collector who took money from the Jews and gave it to the Romans to have any favor with God. The religious elite would have found, thought it impossible for the prostitute to be cleansed of her sin. But God specializes in forgiveness, following repentance, and making people new. That's what he does. And in this parable, the first son felt bad for saying no, and he returned and worked in the vineyard. And you might say that merely saying no was not a sin, but it was, really. He simply disobeyed. You may have seen the billboards uh, around Tennessee that say, real Christians obey Christ's teachings. And being a disciple is more than just being a fan. Being a disciple means that the follower wants to be like the one he is following. The way you become a disciple of Jesus Christ is by setting aside your desires for his desires. It's by setting aside your agenda for his. It's by treating people like he treated people when he was on this earth. And we've got a complete record. We don't even need more than what we have of how Jesus treated and interacted and loved people. To a certain degree, all of us are like that first son. We all want to do our own thing. We want to do what's convenient for us. We all struggle with rebellion. We all struggle with authority at times. We all struggle with stubbornness, some more than others. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23 says, Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. I don't know if it can get any worse than that. Isaiah 53, 6 says, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. We've all rebelled. We've all said no at some time or other to the Lord. But Jesus died on that cross to pay the penalty for our rebellion. He died on that cross to pay the penalty for our stubbornness. Not only did Jesus make it clear that repentance is the key, Jesus made it clear that it's never too late. Never too late for what? It's never too late to become a follower of his. I have a friend who's about 60 years old. And he said that God has just called him into the ministry. So he started his seminary training. He posted some things online that he was, felt called in the ministry. And he's sending out devotions to people who want to subscribe to that. He's got a debilitating illness, but he's not letting that stop him. He's not boo-hooing over not being 25 years old and having a whole many years ahead of him. His life is far from perfect. In fact, much of his life is a big mess. He has a lot of problems, but he's doing what he believes God is calling him to do. So the other night I called him and we had a long talk. He said actually he was called at age 16. But he said no. And now at age 60, he's saying yes. And he has preaching engagements lined up in nursing homes and it through some truck stop ministry. And he starts his Bible classes here before long. And he asked for my advice. 
And I told him several things, one which was this. People will have a hard time believing that you've been called in the ministry because they know about your past. They know about your current problems. But be nice to them and keep on moving. Don't try to convince them. They'll see it over time. It's never too late. You know, if I've just described you, if you were that person who said no, you can do an about face right now. Start where you are. Be open to God leading you. If God called you and you didn't obey, whatever it is, maybe it's not a call to be a minister. Maybe it's just a call to obedience. You can obey right now. There's no need to continue a life of disobedience, rebellion, and stubbornness. You know, people who have a problem with authority just seem to have a lot of problem with authority. You know, they just rebel against every bit of authority. You know, they just rebel against taxes. They rebel against, you know, taking that shopping cart back up to the, <laughs> to the uh, counter. I always say that keeps somebody, that keeps some high school guy employed. You know, they just rebel against every little thing. They rebel against time. No one's going to tell me what to do, when to do it. What's the purpose of that? But likewise, if you're one of those who said yes, but never did, then you can start. You know, Jesus was talking about those religious leaders. The ones who told God, yeah, I'll follow you. I'll go wherever you want me to go. And then Jesus came, which was just a complete game changer, and they realized, oh, well, I didn't know about this guy. You mean I've spent all these years studying these scriptures that we call the Old Testament? And I've, I've, I'm, I'm now part of a profession and my livelihood is caught up in this profession that's based on these scriptures, which does talk about a Messiah, but we don't think that's him. You see, Jesus was nailing them. He said, you're the ones who said yes, but did not follow through. And if you're like one of those who said yes, but never did, guess what? You can start right now as well. Don't be like those religious leaders who knew the scriptures by heart and spent all those years of their life studying and discussing it, but never let it transform them. These are the same people that Jesus called whitewashed tombs, painted to look different than a tomb, but behind that thin coat of paint, still a tomb nevertheless. So not only did Jesus make it clear that repentance is the key, not only did he make it clear that it's never too late, Jesus made it clear that talk is cheap. The son that who says he will work in the vineyard but doesn't do it reminds me of the, the person who has a brief spiritual impulse. The person who might shed a tear every now and then because they hear a sermon that touches their heart temporarily. Or they hear a, a song that touches their hearts temporarily and they shed a tear. They sit in the sanctuary and decide they're going to respond, this person, but they're going to respond to that urge from the Lord. But 10 minutes later, he or she gets in their car They've forgotten it or rationalized that they were just a little too emotional or maybe they were manipulated. And then when they come to their senses, they feel silly and they just go back to living life like they lived it. You know, talk is cheap. Sometimes people I rarely see, I mean like hardly ever, able-bodied people, people who are not caring for a sick loved one, people who are able-bodied in every possible way, 
They're not hindered by a job. They're not hindered by sickness. They're not hindered by some type of unfortunate uh, uh, illness or circumstance. I've, I've noted this my whole ministry. They'll, they'll pop up out of nowhere and try to impress me with how spiritual they are. I, I'm, I'm just baffled by that. I was sitting here one Sunday and somebody I, I didn't even know walked up with a list of all the religious TV she had watched. She just wanted me to know. You know, I really didn't care. I'm not even sure what that was about other than someone just coming out of nowhere and trying to impress me. Well, don't worry about impressing me. I think she'd probably be shocked to know that I never watch any of those programs. I mean, what does she think the preacher does all week? Watch religious TV all week and, you know, call into prayer lines on different programs that have call in your prayer request. I mean, I just try to be kind. Thank you. But I'm, I don't know, what is that? Because, listen, being a follower of Jesus is a serious thing. What is it? Some kind of false security. I handed the preacher a list of religious shows that I watch. One of these days, I just want to get the guts to say, I'm not sure why you want me to know this. You seem able-bodied. Why don't you put all that faith into action and come up here and help us? <laughs> you know, the son who says he will work in the vineyard but doesn't do it reminds me of the one who likes his comfortable life like it is. He's the one who thinks, hey, if I tell dad no, he'll just hire someone else to do it. So why should I do it? You know, he doesn't want any blisters. He doesn't want to be inconvenienced. He wants to do what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, and how he wants to do it. It's all about his schedule. No, Dad, no. I have other things to do today. To his son, work is in the way. He doesn't want the responsibility that comes with being a son. He just wants to be identified as the son of the owner of the vineyard. Yeah, I read articles from time to time about cheap grace, uh, or as we call, call it, easy believism. And it's not a new concept. It's been around since the early days of Christianity. The son who says he will work in the vineyard but does not is like the one who knows that God loves him no matter what. So therefore, he does whatever he wants and he takes no risks and he has no faith. Risks for the Lord, I mean. He's the one who says he's saved by grace and that obeying God is just legalism. He's the one who says that since he, we are saved by grace and not works, then strict obedience is just works and I'm under grace. Yes, the second son. The one who says that he'll go to work but doesn't. He's the one that overthinks it all. He's the rationalizer. He's the one who's tricked himself by his own tricky philosophies. So I've got this image in mind of a person who has grown up knowing the truth. A person who can quote scriptures but in the end refuses to live up to them. He's more concerned about people knowing that he knows the Scripture than he is about letting the Scripture transform his life. From time to time, I tell you about my experiences recruiting chaplains for the Air Force. And I could tell you that it would make a, a very interesting book. One day, I remember thinking, wow, I'm learning a whole lot about human nature and people who say they have a calling from God. I'd been working the job for probably, probably about three years when a name came across my computer screen. We would click on this program and the list of people who 
were, who had applied and, and their stage in the application process would show up and we would have some action to take. That's the best way to describe it. But when, one man's name popped up on the computer screen who was far along in the process, but I didn't know who he was and that wasn't supposed to happen. I was the filter. I qualified, disqualified. That's what I did. Qualified, disqualified. Somebody, this guy just popped in there. How, how, who, who let him in? Who let him around me as the filter? So I started looking into it and realized this guy's application had been processing since before I took the job. He was three years into an application process and had not finished it. And so I, I, he helped me come up with a saying that I used several times. Your application cannot be a part-time hobby that you work on from time to time when you have nothing better to do. You know, either you want this job or you don't want it, but I don't have time to be part of your part-time hobby. And so I usually disqualified those people at my discretion and moved on. I mean, do you want your tax money paying those kind of people? So occasionally one of them would take me seriously and become a good applicant. But folks, listen, words are cheap. Talk is cheap. Action requires effort. Action requires commitment. It requires planning. And what's needed today among those who say they follow Christ are people who do not treat Christ's teachings like a part-time hobby. Well, when I messed up, I'll just go see, okay, what do I need to do now? A little part-time hobby. When we obey his commands, listen to me. When we obey Jesus' commands, we, we are not earning our salvation in any way. We are merely doing our duties as believers in and followers of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> do you believe what I preached to you this morning is true? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, I come to you today praying for everyone who's heard me that you would help all of us to be more firm followers of you. Help us not to be like those who said yes but never did. I don't want to be one of those. I want to be one who says yes and goes and does. Father, I pray for someone here today who for the first time, needs to repent of a life of sin and say yes to Jesus. I pray that your spirit will touch them right now, guide them through their thoughts, through their emotions, and help them to understand what it means to repent and believe. Lord, we know that you sent Jesus all those years ago to pay the price for our sins and to die on that ugly, cruel, mean cross. But we don't stop there, Lord. We know that... that your scripture tells us Jesus resurrected from the dead. And because of that, he gives us the hope of eternal life. Thank you, Lord, for that great gift. Thank you for the hope that you've given us. Help us to follow you in all that we do and all that we say is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.